So we'll move on to the technical part of the program. But first of all, thank you very much to all the previous speakers about all the kind words about science here at Aarhus University. I'm really overwhelmed. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for coming. And least, last but not least, thank you to the foundation for the money. We'll try to use them wisely. Um, and let me say, I fully share the visions that have been laid out today. I, I really think we're standing at the brink of a blockchain revolution. I think the main problem, in my view, is that so far the house has been built on sand. I mean, the blockchain space is really fast-paced. It's so far being driven mainly by people that's either there to get rich fast, don't know what they're doing, or it's driven by some kind of crypto-anarchist idea that you can replace states by technology. And more often than not, all three at the same time. Right? So the reason why I like the vision of the foundation is that it goes directly against these three. So it's a nonprofit foundation. They're founding free research into researchers that actually know what they're doing. And they're focusing on building technology which is maintaining the good parts of the blockchain revolution and getting rid of the bad parts. For example, harvesting the transparency you can get on a blockchain but maintaining privacy. Harvesting the anonymity you can get in a blockchain but at the same time maintaining accountability. Claudio will talk much more about that later, but this focus on doing it in a way such that it embraces legislation is one of the big parts that we are part of this vision. Then a little bit about the center. So we are so far 13 people, mostly right now at computer science, but there's also people from engineering involved and we are expanding. It's a center unto itself, but we are in strong collaboration with the Digit Center Aarhus University Center for Digitalization, Big Data, and Data Analytics. And you can go and look much more at that afterwards. All the people that's on the slide here, they are here today. You can talk more to them at the reception afterwards. Except, I should say, Chaya Ganesh and Daniel Chudi, two of our postdocs, that's at a blockchain uh, conference at Stanford to present some of our results. In any organization of this size, inevitably, someone actually have to do some work. But the rest of us will have a party here today. <laughs> so thanks to Chaya and Daniel for working. So the vision of the center is to focus on the nerdy stuff. We want to build a solid technical foundation under the blockchain future. Okay, So it's free research. Everything is open source. So we hope to build really a foundation on which the blockchain revolution can stand. We'll focus on the nerdy stuff, cryptography, distributed systems, formal verification, programming languages. Some of the areas where here at Aarhus University, we have been doing free, curiosity-driven basic research for 30, 20 years, and therefore now magically have all the tools ready that the blockchain space is, need, it need, is need on to tackle the problems they're facing. So we are really looking forward to joining the vision on the foundation and collaborate for many, many years into the future. So, now to the nerdy stuff. Okay, so the rest of my talk, or our talk, will be about what is a blockchain and what is the kind of research we will do into blockchains, okay? There's been a lot of talk about blockchains the recent years, but probably most of you never saw a picture of a blockchain, so I brought one today. Uh, Ta-da, okay. That's a blockchain, okay. So what you do is you start with the internet, and then, I mean, the internet is a great thing, but then you build layers and layers of technology on top of it, something called peer-to-peer -peer layer, then a consensus layer, transaction layer, and whatnot. And then at some point, you reach the level where people can actually start building applications on top and getting it, and don't have to really worry about all the nerdy stuff in between because it was done correctly once and for all. So that's our vision to do that. So at the center, we're not going to look much at applications. We're not going to make the internet again. That's already been done. So we're focusing on building this blob in there. This is the new stuff, the new foundation of the blockchain future. Along with building these technological layers, we'll also have a heavy focus on so-called formal verification, which across all of this here is a technique that allows to go in and prove that all these things were designed and implemented correctly, that there are no accidental bugs and there is no deliberate trapdoors built into it. So give mathematical proof that the thing is doing the right thing. Okay? So that's mainly what we'll be doing. I'll now 
go on and talk about the two bottom layers there. That's what I'm leading the work package on, peer-to-peer -peer and consensus. And then uh, Bas and Claudio will take over and we'll just work our way up through this thing and talk about what's a blockchain and what is the research we will be doing. So, as I said, you start with the internet. I'm not going to talk much about what the internet is. If you don't know, it's going to be a long afternoon. Um, <laughs> So it's a place, uh, just to remind you, it's a place where you can have a bunch of computers and they can make connections to each other and send messages to each other, okay? Then you build a peer-to-peer -peer network on top of that. That's maybe like 10,000 machines worldwide spread across the planet, each of them with a random 100 connection to other machines, building kind of a random, very robust, highly connected network. It's uh, decentralized. No one owns the network. Anyone can add a machine pick their own connections. So it's extremely hard to censor. And even a huge state organization cannot take such a network down. Just to illustrate it, let's assume some organization took over three machines in my network and want to prevent my network from doing the right thing. The right thing, by the way, for a peer-to-peer -peer network is to spread messages. So it just allows one machine in the network to send a message to everyone else in the network. It's a broadcast channel, OK? So let's say someone over in Russia wants to send a message. It's probably red. Uh, so what they can do is they input it to a machine. Then that machine will just pass it on to the machines it's connected to. They will pass it on to the machines they're connected to, and so on, and so on. And we see that even if the red bad guys here are not passing the messages along, this message will eventually spread to every machine in the network. And you can imagine now if every machine has not three but a hundred random connections, it is literally impossible to take I mean, such a network out, okay? That's the basis for your blockchain. That's it. Okay, Wha then a little bit about the research we'll be doing. One of the things we'll be looking at is mathematical specification of what is the peer-to-peer -peer layer doing, what is it supposed to do. Not how it's implemented, but in a crisp mathematical way specifying what is the contract between the peer-to-peer -peer layer and the consensus layer. The reason why we would like to do that is if you have such a contract, you can replace the peer-to-peer -peer layer with any other peer-to-peer -peer layer, a more efficient one, a more secure one, as long as it's just adhering to this contract. And as we're working on top of it and building better consensus layers, we can just assume that we have this mathematical contract. And since it's mathematical and crisp, we can start proving properties of the higher layers without knowing what the bottom layer is, how it's implemented, but just that it's meeting this contract. And then you can do modular design, improve the components in isolation. And this is just a standard design principle that have shown to be robust. In doing that, we'll I anticipate we'll be working a lot with the separation of responsibilities. What really belongs in the peer-to-peer -peer layer, what really belongs in the so-called consensus layer in a modern blockchain. This is little explored. They're all being built like big blobs today. So we'll be working with that. And when we have that correct separation, we can start building more secure and faster peer-to-peer -peer layers, more secure and faster consensus layers. It turns out that even the language in which to specify what it's supposed to do are not there yet. We don't have the right security models that lean themselves against these very long, very dynamic kind of systems where we can even write down what we would like it to do. So we will also be developing those security models and making, I mean, the language is ready for just expressing what we would like to do. Let's move one click up then to the consensus layer. So as I said, the peer-to-peer -peer layer allows you to send a message to everyone in the network. That's great. The problem is that if two messages are sent at the same time, a red one in Russia, a green one in Africa, they will reach different machines first. I mean, the green one reaches European and African machines. The red one reaches the Russian machines first. Of course, th they will keep spreading. But at the end of the day, we see that in some places, the messages are received in the order green then red. In other places, red then green. And this can be a problem. Let's say the red one is I transfer 100 kronos to Bas. The green one is I transfer 100 kronos to Claudio. And I only have 100 kronos on my account. But then the second one needs to be canceled, right? The problem is it's not defined what is the second message. So now in Russia, Bas have 100 kronos. In Africa, Claudio have 100 kronos. Now they can go spread them. They can go do the same nasty trick. And at the end of the day, every machine in the network will have a different view of where are the money. And people will stop using the system, and it's totally broken. Okay? The purpose of the consensus layer is to bring order into this chaos. 
So the way it works in all, basically all proof of the secure open blockchains is there's some kind of lottery mechanism. Now and then the system will appoint one of the machines in the network and say, you won the lottery. Now the right and the responsibility of the winner is to announce for all the outstanding messages, what should the order be? So this machine here would probably pick its own order, right? It received green, then red, so it dictates to the network the order should be green, then red, and order is restored. Yoo-hoo. We also sometimes say that we are implementing a global ledger. So it's like a virtual book. Everyone can write into it. Everyone agrees what's in the book and in which order it was written. And when you have that, you can start building everything on top of that. Now you have consensus on what was said. We'll be doing a lot of research in the consensus layer because this is one of the novel things of, I mean, blockchains. One of the big things we'll be working on is energy efficiency. We all know that Bitcoin, for example, is using the same amount of energy as Denmark, right? Amazingly, all of this energy goes into the lottery mechanism. All the rest is just trivialities. It's just spread, I mean, passing messages around. It's just this silly lottery that burns that much energy. And the reason why is that the way the lottery is done is now and then a puzzle is announced on the network. It's a computational puzzle. And it's built such that it's really, really hard. Okay, so the puzzle is announced, and now you have to solve the puzzle. The one that solves the puzzle first is the winner of the lottery, okay? And there is a fiscal reward associated with solving the puzzle. You get a fraction of a Bitcoin. So pe really, people really like to solve the puzzle, right? That's to make sure people are running the network. They're not going to solve puzzles for free. So people really like to solve the puzzle, so they buy a lot of machines, and when the Bitcoin goes up, it makes sense to, I mean, spend more money winning the lottery, so they buy more machines. It, Essentially, just taking all the stored value in Bitcoin and turning it into heat. Really nice design, Bitcoin. Okay? So one of the things we've been working on in the center is other ways to do the lottery. So we'll be I mean, working on something called proof of stake, which is using one millionth, a fraction, one millionth the energy that the proof of work kind of lotteries are using. Okay? And we'll be working even on getting that further down and doing more secure lotteries and completely different types of lotteries. So, now we're rid of uh, wasting energy. Another big problem with existing blockchains is throughput. So, they only can handle a few transactions per second. That's a big problem. We'll be working on that too. We are working on that. One of the big techniques there is so-called charting, where you take your 1,000 machines, you instead, instead split them up into 100 groups of each 100 machines. Then they implement like a local ledger. Each of them implement a local ledger. Now we have 100 small networks. They're much more lean, much faster and you have a hundred of them, so you get a hundred times as much throughput, but then you need to put some kind of magic on top that takes 100 local ledgers and turn them into a global ledger. And there's a lot of forefront research going on there for blockchains. We'll be working on that. Throughput is not the only thing. Another big problem with, big, with, with Bitcoin, for example, is confirmation time. From I put a transaction into the network, how long does it take until it's actually accepted and final, as it's called? We saw that order could change, right? We saw that it could happen that in Russia, first we had, in the beginning, we had red, then green. So bars had the 100 kroners, and then the order swapped, maybe two minutes later, to green, then red, then Claudio had the money. So for two minutes, Bar thought he had 100 kroners, and then they went away. That's really bad if he already handed out the oranges, right? So the guy walked away with the goods, and then the money disappeared. So how long do you have to wait until you know your transaction doesn't go away? That's a confirmation time. If you look into the math of Bitcoin, it's about a day. Okay? If you want to be paranoid and it should work when it's under attack and bad network conditions, you have to wait a day. That's a long time if you bought some peanuts and swiped your credit card, right? So what we're working on there is something called uh, finalization layers where we're coming out hopefully soon with the first provably secure finalization layer, which is something you can put on top and then it will, when it will go in and detect when something is final, because best case, it only takes minutes or seconds often. It's only worst case, it could take a day. So it will go in and detect this one is final, and then announce it final so you know it, and then you can walk on. The advantage of that is when the network is in fair weather conditions, finalization will happen within seconds, and you know it. So you swipe your second, you swipe your credit card, you get a beep, you have your peanuts, you walk away, and the shop keeps the money. 
If the new network is under attack, or the internet is in a bad mood that day, it might take 10 minutes, but that's it. You get a guarantee, and you can walk on. Okay. These, in general, into dynamic parameters. I said that Bitcoin had this block time, as it's called, of 10 minutes. They want to have a winner about every 10 minutes. The reason for that is you don't want to have the winners too close, such that now and then some two win at the same time. Then they will announce, I mean, the upcoming order, but they will announce different orders, and we're just back at chaos, right? We need to elect a winner. He should have time to tell the network what is the order of the outstanding messages, and then only then should the next winner come. There should not be interference. So they need to be well spaced apart. And on the day where the internet is in a bad mood and your peer-to-peer -peer network is under attack, maybe it could take five minutes, right? So we have put it, they have put it at 10. Nice conservative value, right? It's built in. The problem is, you build a car, you had to pick at which speed it's driving once, right? What do you put? You put 10 kilometers an hour, right? You don't want your car to go through downtown Aarhus at 130 kilometers an hour. So they have built a car that goes at 10 kilometers an hour, always. Super boring on the highway, right? Then there's other blockchains out there that have put in five seconds. They said, screw it, we put five seconds, then we're faster. Yes, you are, but you're going through downtown Aarhus, 130 kilometers an hour, boom, right? What if we invented something you could put into a car such that you can adjust just the speed according to the driving conditions. Whoa. So we're trying to sell that as kind of dual-use technology to the car industry afterwards. We want to do the same for blockchains. We want to build a blockchain which, when the weather is good and the network is not under attack, the block time is a few seconds, you have very fast finalization. When the network is under attack or the internet is in bad conditions, it just goes up. But doing that is really hard because you have to agree when you do it. And the purpose of this protocol was agreement, right? So you can't agree, it gets cyclic. But we're working on it, and it's coming out this summer in a theater near you. <laughs> the very last thing I want to mention is, is updatability. Inside a the blockchain, there's a lot of cryptography, and Claudio will talk about some of it later, uh, very soon. For example, di digital signature schemes. The thing with digital signature schemes is they do now and then get broken. Like a car will blow a tire, right? The problem with existing blockchains is if the digital signal scheme in the belly of the thing breaks, the blockchain is broken, okay? The mental picture is your car blows a tire, you're like, oh, it's a shitty car, and then you walk away, and then you buy another car, right? Even though the trunk of the car is full of gold. Maybe we want to do that better. Maybe we want to make a car where you can replace the tire and then drive on, right? So we're working on that too, how to have a blockchain that can break a little bit if the crypto is broken, Slow down, we replace it, and then we drive on again.